It's now my opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Mark Lynch. Mark Lynch is Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University, where he is also Director of the Institute for Middle East Studies and of the Project on Middle East Political Science. Professor Lynch is also a non-resident senior fellow at one of the remarkable think tanks in Washington, D.C., the Center for a New American Security. He is also a contributing editor for the Monkey Cage blog for the Washington Post. That name is, you may want to take a minute and explain, if you can, where that name came from, Mark. He is the co-director of the Blogs and Bullets Project at the U.S. Institute of Peace. He publishes frequently on the politics of the Middle East with a particular focus on information technology and political communication, Islamist movements, and the international politics of the region. He had a wonderful career, which he, uh, we talked about during our visit today, at Williams College in Massachusetts. He joined the faculty at George Washington University in 2007. He received his BA from Duke University and an MA and PhD in government from Cornell University. I would also add that he and his wife are the parents of two children, ages 9 and 11. Is that right? And it really is uh, a pleasure to welcome him here. There is in the Atlantic magazine this month a very long article about ISIS and the ideology behind them. It is a very long article. <laughs> and it's attracted a great deal of attention. I was drawn to a testimony that Professor Lynch offered about one week ago to the House Armed Services Committee, about three and a half pages long. The contrast in length and in the pithiness of the wisdom and the analysis is really remarkable. We have a gifted analyst of the region and a tremendous uh, communicator as well. And we're very happy to welcome Professor Mark Lynch. Thank you, Fred, and, th and thank you all for coming out. Thank you for the invitation to be here. It's a real honor and a pleasure to be able to be at BYU and to be part of this conference and uh, to be able to speak to you tonight. Um, I I'm going to forget, so I'll answer your question right now. Uh, the monkey cage, uh, the, the origin of that is a famous quote from H.L. Mencken, the, uh, the great uh, muckraking journalist, um, who said that democracy is the art of running the zoo from inside the monkey cage. <laughs> we, I, 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 that's apt. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, so, so today, I've been asked to talk about uh, the Middle East, and um, and uh, we we settled on the title after the Arab Spring, which is a somewhat uh, controversial title, perhaps, but maybe not so much as it was a little while ago. I mean, look, if you look around the Middle East right now, it, it, it's a disaster. It's just a horrible place right now. Um, it, it's just it's you you almost don't even know where to start. Libya has fallen apart into a civil war, uh, which uh, is destabilizing not only its own country but uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, Yemen has fallen apart uh, pretty much completely. You've seen the seizure of uh, the capital of Sana'a by the, the Shia Houthi movement and uh, what appears to be the very possible separation of that country as well into two competing presidencies since the, as the deposed president has fled down to his home in the south. Um, you have Egypt, which uh, has experienced a military coup and has fallen back into fierce and savage repression. You have uh, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, which has basically come to an end and seems to be going nowhere. And then in Syria and Iraq, you have what appears to be an unstoppable civil war, which has ripped those countries apart, uh, has given birth to ISIS, and seems to be dragging the entire, it's like a black hole, dragging the entire region down towards the abyss. So it's, so, so it's a happy talk uh, I'll be giving today. Um, but to, to think about where we are right now in the Middle East and to really try and get a grip on it, I think it's really important to put that in the context of where we were not so very, very long ago. I think back, you know, February 11th, uh, 2011, not so terribly long ago, the day that Hosni Mubarak left uh, power in Egypt. And uh, this was a day, it came on the tail end of 18 days of popular protest, which had gripped the entire country, which ripped 
riveted the attention of the entire world, in which you had those, that, those unbelievable moments in Tahrir Square, where you had people from all walks of life, different ideologies, different social groups, all come together, seizing the square, demanding democracy, demanding change. And when Hosni Mubarak stepped down uh, on February 11th, uh, this was a moment that just made you suddenly feel like things were possible. You know, when you study the Middle East, when you work in the Middle East for as long as Fred and I have, you kind of get used to things being stuck. Nothing ever changes. You have the same issues again and again and again. How long has the peace process been, go been going on with no change? How long have we been negotiating over the Iranian nuclear program? How long has Iraq been at war? How long have Arab autocracies governed these countries? And we all fall into these routines of analysis and routines of life where we come to expect and to believe that change is just not possible, that things are as they are and you can't escape it. And, and when Hosni Mubarak stepped down, suddenly there was this moment where we dared to believe that things could be different. And when I say we, I mean that in the global we. I mean that in Americans observing the region from the outside. I mean that in the sense of analysts and diplomats who've worked in the region, and I mean it from the perspective of the people who live there themselves. I mean, one of the secrets of the Egyptian revolution, and uh, something that I'll talk about a bit more in a few minutes, is that when they started it on January 25th, when the activists went out into the streets and they organized these large protests, not one of them actually thought they were going to win. I mean, they didn't expect that they were going to succeed. They didn't believe that they could win either. And yet they did it anyway. They went out and protested. It was a, re a remarkable, amazing moment. But that expectation of the impossibility of progress is a deep, paralyzing thing. And it broke for a while. And I think one of the reasons why the Middle East feels so low right now, why so many people seem gripped by an existential despair, is because this is not the way it's always been. Because it's been the betrayal and the frustration of the hopes that many people allowed themselves to have. And so what I want to, what I want to talk about today is basically I'm going to divide it into three parts. Uh, first, I want to talk about what the Arab uprisings were, the so-called Arab Spring, where they came from, how they unfolded, how they mattered. Then I'm going to get into the less happy part, part two, when I'm going to talk about how they failed. And I think comprehensively, with only a few exceptions, they did fail. And um, I'm going to try and talk about why they failed, how they failed, and how it matters that they failed. And then in the third part, I'll turn to what, what Fred was mentioning a minute ago about, um, about ISIS, the rise of ISIS, and spend a little bit of time talking about Syria, Iraq, and this new jihadism, uh, which we're now confronting, and try and place that into the political context which I've just, um, which I've just given you. And then I'll hopefully end with a funny joke. Um, so I'll try and think of one. Um, so let me start with uh, part one, or what the Arab uprisings were, where they came from. So I started with, uh, with the fall of Hosni Mubarak uh, and his departure in February of 2011. There's a pretty long backstory to this, though, and that backstory is really important for understanding where we are right now. And that backstory is that Beginning in roughly the early 1970s, a pretty heavy-handed authoritarianism uh, established itself across the Middle East. And, and this was one which was the kind of authoritarian rule which led to the emergence of these really strong states, states which were able to control, to regulate, and to dominate all facets of life, whether it's the media, civil society, public expression, uh, the economy. Um, and it almost didn't matter at a certain point whether you're talking about kings or presidents, republics or monarchies. The same patterns of rule could be seen uh, increasingly across all of these countries. We Analysts of the Middle East used to make a big deal of the difference between kings and uh, presidents, and then uh, Bashar al-Assad handed power down to his son, just like a king would. And so maybe it doesn't matter so much after all. Um, it doesn't even matter so much the rich and the poor, the oil rich and the, uh, and the poor, because these were embedded in a collective regional system, a regional political economy, a regional politics, which supported this blanket authoritarianism. And you know, if you were working, living in the Middle East in the 1970s, 1980s, it was a dark and dismal time in many ways for any form of 
not just democracy, but basic human rights, freedom of expression, uh, the, the, the freedom of media, the sorts of things that um, you want to see as fundamental building blocks of democracy. This was a time when the state was growing, oil was flowing, money was pouring into the coffers of the state, and they were using it in large measure, not just to build their countries, but also to build large security services and to guarantee that they would stay in power no matter what. It's an interesting thing, which people don't think about a lot. But basically, if you were on an Arab throne in 1970, um, when the Arab uprisings broke out in 2011, you were basically still on the throne, you or your designated successor. Um, and that's an amazing thing, if you really think about it. Over a period of some 40 years, you had almost basically no regime changes. You, had, you certainly had the Iranian revolution, but Iran's not an Arab country. And basically, this system of control was based upon keeping the rulers in power, and it was phenomenally successful at doing so. It succeeded at the expense of freedoms, rights, uh, political participation, civil society, modernization, economic development, um, uh, economic growth, uh, all kinds of things which most people would want to have, but the leaders did stay in power. Now, this begins to change in all kinds of really interesting ways in the decade leading up to the Arab Spring, ways which were largely unrecognized because the power of these Arab authoritarians, these Arab autocrats, was so great, and their control over society seemed to be so absolute that people could see what was happening. They could see it in front of their eyes. Academics like, like Quinn Meekham and others, uh, we talked about this all the time, about all the ways in which the things I'm about to say were happening, and yet it didn't dent the basic conviction that political change was going to be impossible because our experience told us that they would lose every time. But what am I talking about? What I'm talking about is that over the course of the 2000s, you began to see some real changes taking place below the surface. You weren't seeing leaders being toppled. You weren't seeing regimes being changed. But you saw genuine changes taking place at the level of society, at the level of the economy. You saw made significant changes um, in the way that people were beginning to relate to their governments. They were demanding more, they were expecting more, and they were able to express it in fundamentally new ways. The way I, when I look at the Middle East in the, in the decade before the Arab Spring, I don't see what I saw in the 1980s. I don't see this stifling autocracy which prevented anybody from speaking their minds. What I saw was a rising wave of public activism and public dissent and public criticism. In Egypt, the most important and most central of the Arab countries, hardly a day went by in the decade before the, before the Arab Spring when you didn't have some protest somewhere. There were thousands of wildcat strikes taking place in factories. You had every sector of, of, of politics, from students to, uh, to civil society, to unions, to lawyers, to judges. Um, to university professors out there in the streets protesting. You had the emergence of a very critical independent or semi-independent press that were saying all kinds of scathingly critical things about the president and his people. Um, you know, you saw this happening. In Kuwait in 2006, you had a major protest movement. In Jordan, you had major protest movements. You could see this around the region. And it was it varied in, in terms of its depth, its magnitude, its scope. But all of this was unfolding in extremely interesting ways. Again, not that anybody thought that it was going to bring down governments. The government seemed to be firmly in control. But there was a new energy, a new activism, a new dynamism. In a lot of my own work, I tend to emphasize the importance of the media, and uh, especially social media in this period. You had things like the Qatari television station Al Jazeera, which was, which was broadcasting all of these very critical uh, uh, talk shows and news broadcasts, which were bringing information to people never had it before. You go back to the 1980s, if somebody protests someplace in Cairo, secret police would come and grab them and uh, throw them, bring them off to prison to be tortured or killed, and nobody would ever know that it ever happened. By the mid-2000s, the same thing, a small protest with 50 people on a street corner in Cairo is covered by Al Jazeera, and 10 million Arabs see it in real time, including all of those Egyptians who otherwise might not even have known that there was dissent in their own country.
So you are seeing the media, broadcast media, television, and you are also seeing the emergence then in the second half of the decade of social media. And you know, so there's been a lot written about the role of Facebook and Twitter and social media and the revolutions. I tend to fall kind of in the middle camp of how important it was um, in terms of causing those revolutions. But I will say that it was absolutely revolutionary in the sense that you have more and more citizens able to express themselves and able to consume news in sophisticated ways and to communicate and find each other. So in the 1980s, dissidents in places like Syria or places like Libya or places like Jordan would be you know, furtively hiding in their basements and listening to BBC and, and tr hoping that the secret police wouldn't find them. And by the mid to late 2000s, they're on Twitter, they're on Facebook, they're saying scathingly mocking things about the president and the king and the first lady. They're organizing, they're doing all of these things. And so the way that I, always th I looked at this over the course of the 2000s, was that you had this rising tide of protest. The, you know, the tide is coming in, the waves are rising, and they're hitting against, you know, they're, they're hitting against a pretty high break. You know, you've got a, a wall there, and you know, the wave is hitting, and it's hitting here, 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 and everyone's looking at it and saying, man, those stupid waves, they never give up, do they, right? You know, the, the idea was that the, the waves keep hitting, and the wall never falls. What people were missing was that the waves were getting higher and higher and higher, and the walls were developing more and more cracks. And basically, one way to understand the Arab uprisings, 2010, 2011, is not that you suddenly had a wave of protest that came out of nowhere, it's that suddenly the waves got high enough, the wall broke, and then when it broke, the whole sea came rushing in. And the sea didn't come from nowhere. That's the really crucial thing that I'm trying to say, is that you could see this developing over the course of the 2000s. What were the drivers? A lot of the drivers were a lot of the economic changes that were taking place. Uh, what you saw across much of the region was the emergence of this class of what you call a crony capitalist class. People who were getting phenomenally rich and making the International Monetary Fund very happy because GDP growth is growing, going well. And uh, you know, you're seeing lots of people driving, driving fancy cars and flying off to Davos. But meanwhile, the poor are getting poorer. Poverty is increasing. The middle class is being completely wiped out. Um, um, and infrastructure is crumbling, and you're seeing this utter failure of governance taking place across many of the countries in the region. You're seeing growing misery, increasingly open and overt corruption, and the social media and media to bring it all to people's attention. You couldn't avoid knowing about these things anymore. And this was growing, as I said, in this rising wave over the course of a decade. And then it hits. Now, I'll say that academics, policymakers, um, intelligence analysts, almost everybody saw what, what I'm describing. Everybody saw it happening. They just didn't think it was going to break through. Neither did the activists. Nobody thought they were going to break through, but they thought that it was worthwhile to keep trying. The Arab Spring gets going with the revolution in Tunisia. And the revolution in Tunisia was one of those things that I think really couldn't have been predicted um, in the sense of the specific time or the specific place. Revolution breaks out famously, the story that you hear, every single book, I, I can't remember, probably my book too, um, it all starts with Mohammed Bouazizi sets himself on fire and then the flames spread to consume the entire Middle East. You've all heard this story many times before. Um, what's interesting about that is that People like Mohammed Bouzizi had set themselves on fire a dozen times in the previous year and nothing had happened. Um, it's not like this was a mystical thing which started something out of nowhere. Um, there was a moment, though, where something was done differently. The pub there was a publicity campaign. There was the ability to get information out via Facebook. There were protests that stepped up. And it basically, it just spread very, very quickly, and it overwhelmed the ability of the Tunisian military and police to contain what was going on. By the time they figured out what was going on, demonstrators had seized the central square in Tunis, uh, Bourguiba Street, had set up camp. The military told the, uh, the corrupt and ailing president that they were not going to butcher their own people to keep him in power, and he got on an airplane and left. And... You know, so, okay, this is a story which could have been told anywhere, right? But what was interesting about it happening in Tunisia was that even though this was a fairly isolated part of the Arab world, Al Jazeera was covering it heavily. Social media was covering it heavily. Everybody was watching it. And everybody in the entire Arab world 
when they saw Ben Ali flee and they saw success in Tunisia, suddenly everything that I'd said five minutes ago was thrown into doubt. It was the first time that anybody in the region really thought that success was possible. And hope is an intoxicating thing. You know, if you don't think there's any chance of winning, and you know that going out and protesting is going to get you beat up, you know, get your comp passport confiscated, get your sister thrown out of her job, get your parents tortured, you got to be really darn brave to do that. And many, as I said, many people were brave enough to do that. But you introduce the element of hope, the possibility of victory, and a lot more people are willing to take that chance. And that's what you saw in Egypt on January 25th. The activists came out on January 25th. They had every reason to think it was going to be just like all the other times they came out. 10,000 people would go out. The cameras would cover it. They would get beaten up. They would lose. But they would have sent a message. They would have been able to demonstrate that Egyptians were protesting. But when they went out in the streets on January 25th, instead of 10,000 people, like it had always been in the past, now it was a million people. And the million people simply overwhelmed the police. The Egyptian authorities weren't caught by surprise. They were waiting. They were guarding Tahrir Square with troops 10 deep, the ranks 10 deep. But they were simply overwhelmed by the massive numbers of people who came out into the streets. Why did those people come out in the streets? I mean, it's a hard question, but I firmly believe that it's because they had been watching what happened in Tunisia, and that made them believe that victory was possible. Now, I don't have time here to go through the whole story of the Egyptian revolution or of any of these revolutions, but I'll simply say that when Mubarak then falls on February 11th, this is basically turbocharging protest in the entire Arab world. Because basically the script goes from we can never win, Tunisia, maybe we can win, to Egypt, we're definitely going to win. I mean, it's hard to recapture the enthusiasm and optimism of people in February of 2011. Everybody thought that they were going to be next and that it was going to be peaceful and it was going to be fast and that they were going to be able to rapidly overthrow dictators and move towards democracy. And it's a terrible, tragic irony that it never happened again in any Arab country. Um, but you did, in fact, see these massive waves of protest breaking out from Yemen all the way to Morocco. Uh, you saw it in the Gulf. You saw it in the Levant. You saw it in North Africa. You saw it uh, in basically this unified wave of protest breaking out. And when I say unified, I don't just mean simultaneous. I mean that it was actively unified. They were using the same slogans. They were holding up the same signs. They were watching each other protest on Al Jazeera and taking notes on each other and cheering each other on. It was an amazing moment. I, I think I wrote in my book that for me, the definitive moment of the Arab, the, the, the symbol of the Arab Spring for me was was watching Al Jazeera and they would have one of those six, the, the split screen TVs and they'd be showing six different Arab countries simultaneously and people would be marching and protesting and all six of them all chanting the same slogans at the same time. And that, that's an amazing thing, that simultaneity, power, imitation, enthusiasm. But as I said, they all failed, every single one of them. Um, so let me now go to part two, what went wrong. Um, I would say that the simple answer to what went wrong um, is that uh, the, Arab, uh, the Arab autocrats, whose primary goal in life is to stay in power and pretty much nothing else, um, adapted and caught up and decided that they were not going to repeat those messages. And unfortunately, the messages that they took away from Tunisia and Egypt is that if you don't slaughter your own people, um, and if you make any concessions, you are going to be overthrown. Not being overthrown is my only purpose in life. Therefore, I'm going to make sure that doesn't happen to me. And you see then protests giving way to violence and to hardcore state repression almost everywhere in ways that overwhelm the protesters. In Bahrain, uh, you saw uh, the police backed up by Saudi and Emirati troops going in and bulldozing the central square where the protesters were gathered. Remember, at this point, over half the population of the country is in the streets protesting. This is not a small movement. Over half the population of the country is in the streets protesting. Security forces come in, crush it, throw a whole lot of people in jail, massive campaign of repression and torture, and basically defeat and destroy a highly mobilized popular movement. Um, in Yemen, the protest movement leads, the, leads to the split of the military. 
um, the entire armed division breaks off and uh, turns its guns against the central government, and you end up with the protesters seizing a central square with two armed forces on either side of them. Turns into an armed civil war stalemate. Libya, protesters are met with live ammunition, which leads rapidly to it turning into a civil war, which leads to a NATO a military intervention and the eventual overthrow and killing of Muammar Gaddafi. In Syria, the protests are met with live ammunition, extreme brute repression, and brings us into the horrors that we have today. In other places, like Jordan and Morocco, you see the kings kind of getting out in front of the protest, offering limited constitutional reforms, dividing and co-opting the opposition, and basically playing that game uh, fairly effectively and staying in power that way just long enough until the fever breaks and the momentum dissipates, and then it, things settle back down into that dreary, uh, uh, that, that dreary reality. And even in Egypt, things go bad rather quickly. Uh, the protesters were unable to turn their momentum into any sustained move towards democracy. And uh, you know, and I could, again, I could go on and on and on and on and on about uh, what happened in Egypt. It was one of the worst managed transitions I think in history, um, and uh, people made a whole slew of extraordinarily stupid decisions along the way, but it's not because they're stupid. I mean, Egyptians are savvy. They're smart. They were doing the best they could, but they were doing so in a deeply uninstitutionalized, unpredictable environment in which they were they were scared of each other, scared of the future, and uh, they basically gave in to their worst impulses at every step of the way. Egypt had a chance. I mean, there's a narrative right now that Egypt never had a chance, and I fundamentally disagree with it. Um, I actually thought that Egypt had a very real chance of making a transition to democracy, but I think that that it, it just wasn't meant to be. I'm happy in the Q&A, happy to go into more about why it, I think it is that Egypt failed, but Egypt did fail. Um, and uh, it, it's a, attempted transition to democracy ended on July 3rd with a military coup, and Egypt today is considerably more repressive, more authoritarian, more xenophobic, more intolerant than it was before the revolution. It's a very sad turn of events. The only country which has managed to avoid this fate is Tunisia, and I was there a couple months ago, and it, it really is impressive to see that Tunisia made it. People forget, and, but when I say they made it, I mean that they managed to hold excessive elections, which led to the peaceful rotation of power, and to adopt a new constitution, which commanded a strong majority of popular support and, and gave solid foundations for progress going forward. Um, and that's fantastic. But people forget that um, it came extremely close to failing. The summer of 2013 was extremely polarized. There were assassinations in the streets. There was talk of a new coup. And I personally believe that the only reason that Tunisia avoided Egypt's fate was that Tunisians looked at how horrible Egypt was and decided that they didn't want to go that route. And they took a step back from the brink in order to avoid Tun uh, Egypt's fate. But in the elections which followed, um, and the ones which gave us a, a successful move towards democratization, the winners were essentially the old regime. And figures, not just figuratively, but literally, uh, the, the current, uh, the newly elected president, Asipsi, was a figure of the old regime. And in many ways, the old regime has now got, come back into power um, through elections. Now, I still am very optimistic about Tunisia. I love Tunisia. And I think they have a good chance of succeeding. But it really is the exception. And uh, almost every place else has failed. Basically, what you have is the, the, the weak states were shattered. That's what the, your Libyas and your Yemens. Uh, the strong states crushed dissent, and the ones in the middle had that kind of Egypt-Tunisia experience. Um, which then brings me to the last thing I want to talk about, which is this, uh, the rising jihadism, ISIS, and the, law, and the effects of the failed states and the wars that we're now living through. And it's really quite, uh, you know, for the only success I can point to is Tunisia, I can point to a lot of really horrific failures. The, the Syrian civil war is one of the great humanitarian catastrophes of the post-Cold War world and arguably one of the greatest ever. It's a country where something in the ballpark of a third of the population is now refugees, either internally or externally, where even the conservative counts of the dead, and no one really has any solid count of the dead, uh, are 
astronomical. Entire the entire cities have been bulldozed, and basically the the country has become a wasteland of civil war and warlordism, which is unlikely to be restored anytime in the next uh, five to seven years. Whether the United States intervenes or not is largely irrelevant at this point, um, and has been for a very long time. Um, this is a shattered country, and uh, and again. That's, that's in Syria. It, the spillover effects went into Iraq. Iraq has now experienced many of the same uh, conditions. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But it also extends to Libya and Yemen, where states have been complete, the states that fell haven't been replaced by anything. And you essentially have ungoverned spaces, which are characterized by intense polarization, localization of politics, militia rule. And uh, you know, you're looking at these places where it's not, I mean, so jihadism captures the attention and these jihadist groups do demand attention, but the larger story is that it, it's very difficult to imagine how these countries will be put back together and become functioning countries with normal economies that can produce a new generation of aspirational youth. I mean, these are shattered countries. At least four, um, and that's my, my, my nice count, is that um, you have at least four countries out of the 20 countries in the Arab world, which are just fundamentally and potentially irrevocably shattered. And uh, that's going to have long lasting consequences. Now, what ISIS? ISIS is the thing which we now focus upon the most in our in our research and in our analysis and certainly on TV, and um, and then for good reasons. I mean, ISIS represents a real threat and a real challenge and a really a particularly vicious strand of jihadist organization. Um, where did it come from? How does it fit into all of this? So basically, you have the kind of a narrow and then a, a wider view of this. The narrower view is that it's an organization which comes out of a combination of the Syrian civil war and the legacies of the American occupation of Iraq. So the organization itself, ISIS, it emerges out of the Iraqi insurgency. And uh, the Sunni Iraqi insurgency, which the United States was fighting, I understand John Nagel was here last week. I'm sure he had something to say about it. Um, that the United States was was helping to fight this insurgency in uh, in Iraq, and when we can talk all day about the emergence of the insurgency, the surge, the uh, the uh, awakening, the Iraqi awakening, where tribes and uh, and nationalist uh, militias turned against Al Qaeda. It's a fascinating story. At the end of it. Um, the Al Qaeda in Iraq, which became the Islamic State of Iraq, never vanished. It was beaten back, but it never disappeared. Its infrastructure wasn't uprooted. Many of its individuals survived. They went into hiding. They, they, they left and went back out to Syria, but they were always able to come back. And over the next few years, this, the Prime Minister of Iraq, Nouri al-Maliki, squandered everything which had been gained by ruling as an extraordinarily sectarian, corrupt, would-be despot, basically trying to do to Iraq uh, the sorts of things that I was talking about before, establishing a highly sectarian, corrupt form of government which would guarantee that he would stay in power forever. Part of that meant that he ended up alienating many of those Sunnis that had turned against al-Qaeda and tried to join up and become a renewed part of the Iraqi state. Many of the factions which had aligned themselves against Iraq, against uh, 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 al-Qaeda, flipped back. Protest movement broke out, and that protest movement was repressed with brutal, bloody force by Maliki's forces, driving more and more Sunnis back over to the side of the insurgency. So one part of ISIS is that it's simply the resurgence of a very, very, very familiar enemy in Iraq. And the primary culprit in its evolution was the combination of the occupation of Iraq and then more proximately, the sectarian misgovernance of Iraq by Nouri al-Maliki. Um, simultaneously, um, beginning in March of 2011, the civil war breaks out in Syria. Um, it starts off as a peaceful uprising. It's met with horrific brutality on the part of the Assad regime, which basically is slaughtering peaceful protesters and um, doing everything it can to uh, crush it by force. By the time you get to the end of 2011, the uh, Syrian peaceful mo uh, 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 movement is increasingly militarized and increasingly becomes an insurgency. Money and guns flood in from the outside, from Turkey, from the Gulf, um, and more and more of those money and guns go to extremist Islamist factions, uh, of which um, ISIS 
emerges as a breakaway from uh, one of those al-Qaeda affiliated factions, uh, Jopar al-Nusra. Uh, Al-Nusra uh, was just one of many of these armed uh, Islamist factions that were fighting in the civil war. And ISIS basically emerges in Syria as one of dozens of these, uh, of these organizations fighting in the shattered terrain of the Syrian civil war. Its advantage is that it was able to hook up with that renewed insurgency in Iraq, and by erasing the border between them, it was able to gain some real advantages. Weapons captured in, in Iraq could be sent up to the front line in Syria. Money captured in Syria could be sent down to Iraq. They were able to work together in order to buy, and, and basically to give them an advantage that none of the other fighting groups had, and that gave them a huge advantage. They would have continued, I think, as just one of the many groups if it weren't for the sudden light, lightning blitzkrieg uh, across uh, Iraq in the summer of 2014 when you suddenly saw them seizing Mosul, uh, the third largest city in Iraq, moving quickly towards the gates of Baghdad and towards Erbil and people suddenly were forced to pay attention to this. What's amazing about this though is that they did this with a very small number of fighters and in alignment with local forces and they were able to gain enormous successes. Two Iraqi armed divisions simply ran away when they saw the Islamic State forces coming towards them. Why did they do that? Because of the sectarian misgovernance of Iraq, uh, which had led to basically these empty uh, phantom divisions where people were, in no sense of the word, willing to die or fight against people who they had watched online decapitating their prisoners. They'd much rather run away than fight against that. And so ISIS was able to grab this territory, grab resources, capture American weaponry, American-provided weaponry, loot uh, the wealthy areas of Mosul, and then all that money is able to then to go back to Raqqa, go back into Syria, and they establish this thing called the Islamic State. That's just Syria and Iraq, though. And if that's all it was, then I don't think we'd be talking about it quite so much. Um, I think what we worry about is that it, we worry about it becoming a global movement. And we worry that it is, in a sense, becoming the vanguard of this new caliphate, this new vanguard of, uh, of an existential war between Islam and the West. And uh, people will talk, you've probably seen these maps online where they'll show like uh, this black shroud covering two thirds of the map of the Middle East and everything. And I gotta tell you, I mean, this is extraordinarily um, irresponsibly exaggerated. You know, so like Algeria will be placed under the caliphate and the official assessments of Algeria is that there's about 20 people in, uh, in the ISIS affiliate in, to, in, in uh, Algeria. Um, the only places where ISIS has actually managed to set up a real strong hold of any kind is in the Sinai and in Libya. And what do those two places have in common? They are shattered states that are completely ungoverned in which there were already Islamist insurgencies going, for, going on. Um, in uh, the Sinai, there was Ansar al-Bayt al-Maqdis and a number of other indigenous um, uh, uh, Islamist uh, jihad organizations that were fighting there. And that was all, so it was a place that was ripe and open for ISIS to establish itself. And similarly in Libya, shattered state, Islamist militias everywhere, and open borders, and again, the kind of place where they could establish themselves. So that's the extent of their spread. There's the inspiration, but here we're back in the territory which was pioneered by Al-Qaeda. And here ISIS is competing with two other types of Islamism. They're competing with Al-Qaeda and they're competing with the Muslim Brotherhood. And what they're competing for is to try and establish themselves as the leader of Islamist uh, politics around the region. They want to capture all of those disgruntled, alienated people who are looking for some kind of movement who, where they can fight against the status quo that they hate. Al-Qaeda used to be that vanguard. They tried to be that vanguard. But Al-Qaeda has fallen on very, very tough times. Bin Laden was killed. Um, there's been a relentless war against Al-Qaeda's forces, um, uh, 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 counterterrorism campaigns. And Al-Qaeda's brand has lost a great deal of its luster. ISIS has been able to appeal very effectively to the types of people who once would have been attracted to Al-Qaeda. But those are an enormously small number of people. That's what we tend to forget. Uh, we talk about the flow of foreign fighters into Syria and Iraq, and the numbers are mind-boggling, right? 40,000 fighters have flown in. 
That's the most they have ever gone on this kind of foreign fighting crusade before. And yet, 40,000 out of 1.3 billion Muslims. Al-Qaeda was never a mass movement. They were never able to. They wanted to be, but they couldn't be. And I suspect ISIS is in the same place. The other major competitor is the Muslim Brotherhood, a mainstream Islamist movement which participated in elections, participated in public life, and genuinely was a mass movement. Al-Qaeda and ISIS together, you know, they might have, you know, somewhere in the tens of thousands of adherents. The Muslim Brothers could claim in the multiple millions of adherents. But the Muslim Brotherhood has also fallen on tough times. Uh, after the military coup in Egypt, they were fiercely repressed. Their leadership, their organization uh, imprisoned and crushed uh, large numbers of their people um, uh, either driven into exile or thrown into jail. And then around the region, they've been criminalized. They're the, they're the focus of a, of, a, of, a, of a kind of a region-wide security crackdown. And the result of this is that this mass organization, which in the past would have been able to take those alienated, disgruntled people and give them a political direction, they've been crushed. You know, what are you going to say if you're trying to talk to, you know, put yourself in the mind of an angry, is, you know, kind of politicized 23-year-old uh, Muslim in Cairo, and you want to say to him, look, join, join into formal organized politics, run in elections, and everything will be fine. You can't say that anymore, because the lesson is that you compete in politics, and then if you win, the elections are canceled, and you're thrown in jail, and you're tortured, and possibly killed. It's not a very uplifting message. Um, and so basically what we've seen is that the combination of the failures of the Arab Spring and the crushing of the Muslim Brotherhood has created a growing pool of really alienated, angry young people who no longer see any other alternatives. ISIS is bidding for the support of those people and getting only a fraction of that support, but that's been enough so far to sustain them in what is really a, 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 you know, a, a low manpower enterprise. What does it mean for us going forward? And here I'm going to wrap this up because I want to be sure we have time uh, for questions. A lot of things I know that I haven't discussed. Um, what it means uh, for us going forward is that, uh, you know, and here I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fall back into the ethnocentric American us is that we're looking at a region where uh, you know, we, we're, we have a real dilemma. We, we want to fight ISIS. If you listen to the president's uh, comments about uh, combating violent extremism um, last week, you'll see that he and, and, and the White House, they understand that it, if you want to fight these people, and prevent, prevent them from recruiting, you need to give them a better alternative. You need to give them human rights and democracy and reform and economic hope and, uh, and all of these things. But unfortunately, all of the governments that we're allied with are going in the other direction. They're becoming more repressive, less democratic, and uh, more abusive of human rights, which means that our partners are, are more or less actively working against the solution that we know we need to bring about. People who once saw hope in 2011 are dispirited. Dispirited is actually probably too, uh, too mild of a word. They're furious. They're outraged. They're alienated. They see no prospect of a return towards democracy. Democracy. And um, we're in a position where we're being drawn back in to things like Iraq, which I think many Americans were happy uh, to be rid of. Um, so I think that what we're going to be facing for the foreseeable future is we have very few viable, effective partners in a region which is in immense turmoil but where we are actually fairly marginal players, where we do not decide the outcomes in any of these places and have a very limited ability to speak to the hopes, the fears, the aspirations of the people in the region that I think we would like to reach. Analytically, I mean, I'm, I, I think it's probably pretty clear by now that I'm not particularly optimistic um, about the region in the short term. I don't think Egypt is going to be able to, go, is going to go back to a uh, path to democracy anytime soon. And I see no signs whatsoever that uh, the current president is going to be able to solve the economic or social problems which caused the revolution in the first place. Um, I, I don't see any real reason for expecting um, you know, a move in a democratic direction or a return to stability. I don't think the Syrian civil war is going to be resolved for another half decade. Um, I, I don't think that um, we're going to see... Um, a, a reversal of those trends. Um, if we if we manage to get a nuclear deal with Iran, I think that will help quite a bit, um, but it's not going to solve all, all of these unresolved problems. 
At the same time, and here's where I am going to try and end on a somewhat uh, more positive note, I, I still believe that over the longer term, all of the trends are still in the direction of of, of the inevitability of change. Uh, the, this is still an extremely young population, a wired population, and one that has seen the possibility of change. I think the, uh, the odds of going back to the old, comfortable authoritarian bargains of the control of information, of uh, these uh, endless authoritarian regimes, is, ex is exceedingly low. I think we're going to be seeing turbulence, contention, challenges, surprising collapses of regimes happening with remarkable frequency over the next five to ten years. Um, does that mean that we're going to see transition to democracy? I, I'm not as optimistic about that. But, you know, so if you think that, uh, that turbulence and uh, challenge and, um, and instability is a good thing, then we have some good things um, coming our way. Um, and, but, and I say this not to be flippant, but simply to say that if we recognize that and direct policy towards trying to manage that and push it in a more positive direction, we're much more likely to have success than with some of the grander aspirations that we might once have had. And with that, I'll stop stop and uh, try and answer all of your questions. Thank you. We would like to invite those who have questions for Professor Lynch to line up behind the mic on this side of the room. If you would, just briefly identify yourself and then state your question. And. Um, Professor Lynch will allow you to, uh, to manage it from this point. After the end of the Q&A, we will have a couple of uh, announcements just having to do with uh, getting all the delegates transported to the next, uh, next part of the conference. But uh, for now, the Q&A, please. Hello, my name is Michael McCall. I had a question uh, regarding the transitional uh, process in Yemen. Uh, it, was, it was fairly well stage managed by the GCC. So in terms of the anarchical situation which permeated most of, the, most of the transitions to democracy, it should have been the one that more or less went the most smoothly. But now, of course, you can see that Ali Abdullah Saleh continues to wield quite a bit of influence in the, in the post-revolution uh, the, the, the post government or the, po the post-revolution situation in Yemen. What was the fundamental failure in the GCC transition plan that could have caused this whole situation to be avoided? No, it's a great question. So what happened in Yemen, uh, for those, uh, I guess I didn't probably say enough about it, was that um, the it started off with these mass protests, and then uh, you saw the army split, as I said, and then it led to this protracted stalemate. Uh, the then president, Ali Abdullah Saleh, was actually almost killed in an assassination attempt and uh, survived. He, had, he went out to Saudi Arabia for treatment for a while. Things continued on, continued on, until finally uh, there was a GCC-brokered uh, transition deal, which the United States was heavily involved in. Um, and the idea behind that was that he would hand off power to his, uh, to his vice president and uh, um, which is what which is what happened, and you saw then a managed transition, which would involve maintaining the institutions of the state and then holding an extended national dialogue designed to uh, build a consensus around a new constitution. And this was the Yemen model that you hear referred to so derisively uh, these days. Uh, the fundamental flaw, and I think there was a fundamental flaw, was that this was so carefully stage managed from the top that they failed to get adequate buy-in from anybody else. And so very symbolic of this was that the, the president was elected in a single candidate election. Um, and, you know, I, so I, I just like it's an election with no opposition. And uh, you know, so that kind of tells you a little bit about the stage managed dimension of it. You know, people looked at this and they saw it as a bit of a farce. And then when the national dialogue was un going underway, again, it was carefully sta stage managed. And many of the stakeholders, the activists, the youth, uh, the Houthis and others, uh, felt that they were left out of it. And there was a feeling that deals were being cut um, behind their backs. And so the, the, the straw which breaks the camel's back uh, uh, not too long ago was when the results of that uh, national dialogue were were re were uh, kind of being reported and being released, and uh, the Houthis were extremely upset with uh, the provisions for federalism. There, basically, they saw it as a resource and power grab uh, from the center against their areas. They moved against it, uh, seized the capital, and brought the whole thing to a halt. Um, but, but, not, but not because they were Iranian proxies carrying out a military coup, uh, but because they saw their traditional, um, uh, their traditional position in, in, the, in their part of Yemen 
uh, being threatened by this new constitution, which they hadn't really had a place at the table for in the negotiation process. Um, sitting behind that, though, I mean, that's the politics of it. Sitting behind that is the fact that just Yemen is an incredibly poor place, which um, basically three and a half years of revolution and then political transition had brought the whole thing to a halt. Uh, the economy had come to a standstill. There were massive environmental problems, uh, water, you know, water shortages, uh, incipient famine, and uh, people were just really living on the edge and, and living at the bone. And that's, the, I think, the undercurrent uh, for a lot of this. Um, and where it looks like we are now is actually wouldn't surprise me a bit if you ended up seeing the establishment of dueling presidencies. And, you know, Yemen was only unified in 1994, and um, seeing uh, the, the, the ex president or current president, or he resigned and then he went on TV. He, he resigned and then he escaped from custody and showed up in the South and then unresigned and said that his resignation had been under duress. So we don't know whether to call him the president, the ex president, or the ex ex president. Um, but whatever he is, he's down in his stronghold in the South now, and you could end up at, look, with it looking something like Libya does, where you have kind of Tripoli and Benghazi and kind of two dueling claimants on, on legitimacy, and it's unlikely to end well. The nice thing about Yemen, of course, though, just to finish the thought, is that they're used to living without a government, you know, so, so it might work out for them. Oh, uh, my name is Joseph Gooden. I'm a political science major here at BYU. Um, at the risk of going off on a tangent, um, my area of study is more uh, on Latin America, and the protests in Mexico and Venezuela specifically have um, interested me a lot, and, and how the Arab Spring might have influenced those protests as well. And my question is, what must Latin America do to avoid the problems that the Arab Spring faced in its ending days? Well, the second part of that is a great question, which I'm not even going to try and answer, because I don't know anything about Latin America. Um, I, I can almost find it on a map, I think. Um, so so I'm not, not gonna, I don't, I don't want to waste people's time by trying to answer that. But the first part of the question I will try and answer, because it's actually fascinating, is that yeah, the, what you saw, so the Arab Spring and the diffusion there was incredibly intense within the Arab countries, a very clear sense of identity, a clear sense of shared fate and purpose. But many of like the, the modal types of protest which were pioneered in the Arab Spring, you do see them being adopted all over the world. You saw them in the Hong Kong protest. You saw them in, in Wisconsin um, during the recall effort against Governor Walker. Um, you saw you know, this, uh, this, these modal ideas of the seizure of central space, um, and the issuing of demands and a lot of the, the use of social media and the use of YouTube and, all, and the use of social media that were pioneered in the Arab Spring were being adapted all over the place. And again, you, you see it in, in, uh, in Italy and Greece. You see it in, I'm sure, some of these Latin American countries that I don't know about. Um, but uh, so, so I think that you are seeing this kind of almost universalized protest type that uh, might have been unusually intense in the Arab world, but people were watching from all over the world, and they were taking notes, and they were learning lessons. If I were, want to say a general kind of lesson of the Arab Spring, which might be relevant to Latin America or might not be, it would simply be that that sort of stuff is much better at mobilization um, than it is at consolidation. In other words, the, the tools of social media, the tools of that were important in the Arab Spring are really good for getting people out into the streets for a short period of time for a specific goal. But they're terrible at kind of settling down afterwards and building civil society, building political parties, winning elections. And I think that in almost every single Arab country, that's what you saw. The activists that were so success successful during the revolutions end up being frustrated and alienated afterwards because they can't figure out how to adapt to, uh, to, to the new situation. In the case of places like Syria and Libya, they end up dead or in exile because, you know, the nice kids with camera phones, you know, can't really stand up to the hard men with guns. Um, and in the case of Egypt and Tunisia, they find themselves electorally sidelined and um, unable to compete. Mm -hmm. My name is Frederick Lusheen, and I'm a political science major here at BYU. My question is, with the involvement of Kurds and the Peshmerga fighters in um, the conflict against ISIS, what do you think of the viability of a Kurdish state, and also what is your opinion, whether we should support that or not? <laughs> 
So a lot of people have um, been, so they've been looking at what the Kurds have done in fighting against ISIS and, or against ISIL or whatever we're calling it now, um, and, uh, and the Pesh, Mirga, and they see it as a strong argument for the emergence of a new Kurdish state. I don't think it's a good idea. Um, I don't think it's particularly viable. Um, and and uh, I personally, I think that uh, the U.S. government has been right to continue to funnel arms through Baghdad and try to keep the central state together. But I think if you talk to Kurds, I mean, they're very clear that they view Iraqi Kurdistan as essentially already functionally independent. And I think that what you're looking at is some kind of loose federalism inside of Iraq. The problem with, with uh, Kurdish succession is that it intersects with issues, with all kinds of other issues. Uh, so you have, it, it affects the vital national interest of Turkey, it affects the interests of, um, of, of Iran, and it also yeah, would have repercussion effects on, into Syria and the Syrian, Syrian Kurdish areas. It also would be extremely dangerous for Iraqi Sunnis because you can imagine a, a viable uh, Kurdish Iraqi state. It wouldn't be the tremendously viable. It would be highly dependent on the neighbors that surround it. But you could imagine it being, you know, with oil resources and um, pipelines, and so you could imagine it being viable. But uh, the Sunni parts of Iraq, if you imagine that Iraq is going to be partitioned three ways, is completely non-viable. They have no resources. Um, the territory is mostly desert. And um, if there was actually a three-way partition of Iraq, they they would be uh, one of the poorest uh, and most indefensible states in the world. And I think most Iraqi Sunnis recognize that, and that's why they continue to be largely, um, largely fe uh, a federalist. Um, in terms of Kurds declaring independence, I mean, I, I don't really see what they would gain by it, to be perfectly honest. As long as they can get a good deal um, out of Baghdad on the, on the distribution of oil revenues, and they get left alone to administer their own affairs. Um, they get everything they really want without having the, all the problems, diplomatic problems that would come from actually declaring independence. So I, my, my expectation is that it'll probably continue as it is. Um, but you know, everybody. There was an article. Uh, that people are starting to pay attention to this now. Is that um, you know when Mosul falls. Uh, and it will fall. Uh, ISIS will be driven out of Mosul eventually, I'm pretty sure. Um, who's going to retake it? Is that going to become a Sunni city again, or is it going to be a Kurdish city again? The Kurds seized Kirkuk in the middle of this uh, collapse, the, in the middle of this uh, collapse, and um, I don't know a single Kurd who ever wants to give up Kirkuk again. This was a disputed city, which was as one of the major flashpoints between uh, Kurdistan and uh, main, mainline Iraq. And um, you know, so who's going to, who's going to repatriate uh, Kirkuk? Uh, no one really knows. So um, as long as you remain part of a single Iraq, you don't have to resolve those issues. But if you partition, you're going to have to decide where is the border and is Kirkuk in it or out of it? Is Mosul in it or out of it? And I think most uh, rational people, okay, there's the problem. Um, <laughs> sorry, next. <laughs> so my name is Benjamin Schmidt, and I'm an international relations major at BYU. And so reading through... Uh, not only listening today, but also reading through your comments. Uh, we read it in class with Axel, Professor Axelgard or Dr. Axelgard. Um, your comments on the 15th before the House Armed Service Committee about this same topic. Mm -hmm. Your two points seem to be, number one, that Islamic State or ISIL or ISIS does not speak for Islam. And number two, that the context of what is happening in the Middle East recently has to be seen within or in the context of what happened in 2010, 2011, mm -hmm. the fact that those revolutions failed, and that was, that was the moderate way, that was the political change that mm -hmm. failed, and so then there's a fringe that's more extreme that's trying to find a way now, and they're getting more support. And you talk about strategic communications that mm -hmm. the US could engage in to counter the ideology. My question is, what, what could those be? And then number two, where do we start from a policy perspective? What are the countries and the regimes that the United States can actually influence to actually allow moderation? Yeah, and those are great questions. And, um, and, I, and, I, and I think that sums up what I was trying to argue very nicely. Um, the, uh, in terms of U.S. strategic communications, um, I mean, I really think that the fundamental point, uh, the, the fundamental guiding star has to be to not buy into the kind of exaggerated claims that ISIS makes. In other words, don't take their rhetoric at face value. They say they're, you know, they, they say they're a caliphate, you know, and I, I say I'm a pink unicorn and I can fly. Right? It doesn't make it so. 
And I think that by tr by taking their idea, their their rhetoric at face value, in a sense, we we give them more. We we facilitate their their um, their own um, aspirations and goals. Um, so the strategic communications should be to constantly denigrate and da denigrate and downplay. Uh, their ambitions and to consistently highlight their their genuine extremism. In other words, saying that they are the authentic face of Islam, which is now a popular thing to say, strikes me as, as both absurd. I mean, it just I mean, it strikes me as clearly and obviously wrong. Um, you know, if you if you go and you look. And you look around the world, and you got 1.3 billion Muslims, and um, you know 1.29999 of them are saying these guys are horrible extremists who don't speak for me. You know who are we to say? Oh no, no, you're wrong. Actually, ISIS does speak for you because I went back and I read the Quran, and they're right. They, they've got it right. I mean, I mean this 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 article in the Atlantic, um, I, I think, is just it's fundamentally misguided if to to think that that and so so it's wrong, but it's also strategically stupid. Because essentially what it does is it grants them power and authority that they don't have on their own. And so by, by saying that they are the true face of Islam, you're basically granting them victory in the most important uh, uh, kind of political and rhetorical battle that they're fighting. So everything should be geared towards denying them that victory. Don't turn this into a clash of civilizations. Don't turn this into every Muslim has a, a Sharia, a, you know, a desire for the caliphate lurking in his heart. Don't turn this into we must uh, fight against Islam. That's because that, to me that's exactly the wrong approach. The approach should be that uh, we're on the side of Islam and uh, all, both of us have this common enemy which is this small extremist group which is threatening all of us equally and that, to me that's the way to do it I also don't think that um, you know getting in, getting engaged in uh, kind of theological arguments is helpful at all um, you know so there you know you have these uh, you know the the, the Sheikh of al-Azhar or the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia going out and, and giving um, you know these denunciations of their ideology. I mean, it's useful in its own way, and it certainly helps to establish a marker between them and and ISIS. And that is, that is, I suppose that is useful. It's not likely to be persuasive to anyone, and it doesn't substitute for the need to carry out the kinds of uh, governance reforms that I was talking about before. That ultimately, you can do all the theological argument you want, but if you're still producing alienated, angry, desperate people who hate the status quo, then and it, it's not really going to help. And that's one of my biggest critiques of where we are right now is that m we, the partners that we're choosing to work with simply have no moral authority or practical authority to speak from. You know, the Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Egypt is, uh, you know, he's the bloody dictator of a military regime who has 40,000 political prisoners and oversaw the slaughter of 1,000 people in one day in the central square of Cairo. Um, so, you know, when he lectures on moderation and democracy and human rights, no one takes that seriously. When the king of Saudi Arabia talks about liberalism, I mean, come on. I mean, it's Saudi Arabia. Um, I mean, I, I, again, not to, be, not to be flippant about it, but, you know, the, you're looking for moral authority from people who are the source of the problems that started the Arab Spring in the first place. You're going to have real problems. I don't think that the U.S. is going to be able or willing to really push on human rights or democracy in the short term because we have no reliable friends in the region. Um, we have no effective, authoritative um, partners with which, on which to draw upon, which is, if you think about it, a real indictment of uh, decades of U.S. policy. Um, but it, I think it really is the case right now. And the, only, the only country that we really seem to be able to full, you know, wholeheartedly uh, identify with and support is probably Jordan. Um, and, uh, and, and Jordan is a great little country. I mean, I lived there for three or four years, and uh, they've, they've dealt with an almost unbelievable burden of refugees and um, spillover from the Syrian war and everything else. And so I, I fully agree with supporting them. But this is still a king overseeing an authoritarian regime, and it's a very small, unstable country. It's not really the basis for uh, a grand strategy in the region. So I think we're, we, we do have a real dilemma. We don't have a lot of viable partners, and, um, and, and, and it's unlikely that we'll be able to pressure them uh, to do these things when we need them so desperately. And so, it, it, so it, it's a real conundrum on, on the policy side, I have to admit. Let's take these two final questions, quick questions. Okay. 
Sorry, I tend to give long answers, but uh, I'll do my best. Okay, quick answers, too. You mentioned, the, uh, you mentioned Egypt, and you felt like... I'm sorry, Egypt. your name? Oh, my name is Abe Collier. Yeah. I'm here at BYU, and philosophy, actually. And you mentioned Egypt. You thought that, the, that Egypt could have been transitioned to a democracy quite well, quite easily, but it didn't happen. I was wondering, in as much time as you have, if you could expand on that. No, I, I wouldn't have said easily. I think nobody ever thought it was a sure thing, but I think it was a real possibility. And I actually think that... You know, the, one of the things that you saw in Egypt was just they kept changing the rules in midstream. The, the judiciary played an extremely negative role. So they kept like they dissolved that you elect a parliament then they dissolve the parliament. You, uh, you know, and, you know, that, that was a hugely negative thing that they did. Um, but I think the fundamental point where things really went irrevocably wrong was in uh, the, the run-up, like the first half of uh, 2013, when you saw the movement towards this, uh, the Tamar protest movement and then the military coup. And basically, the critique there was that President Morsi was hopelessly incompetent, endangering, um, endangering Egypt, and was trying to impose kind of Islamic uh, domination over everybody else. And you know, it was pretty clear that uh, he, he was a terrible president. He didn't command popular support. He was ruling erratically and doing all kinds of lousy things. But they also could, were, if things had gone as they should have, they were only like six to eight months away from new parliamentary elections, which presumably, having misgoverned so horribly, the Muslim Brotherhood was going to lose decisively. And then you would have been in, a, if that had happened, you could have been in a situation like you were in Tunisia, where now you have a balance of power uh, between the two, between two institutions. You have Morsi fighting for his political life, forced to compromise, and you could have imagined the normalization of politics. Um, that was, to me, that was the great moment where things, you know, because Egypt had been, you know, unbelievably turbulent for that entire period, but it always seemed to pull through. And forward momentum continued, but then the military coup basically just, it was, ba it was basically giving up on, on normal politics. And it's very, and the, the, the historical legacies, historical you know, comparisons suggest that it's extraordinarily difficult to come back in the short term from a military coup. Once you've broken the institutions, it takes a long time to rebuild them. Thank you. Jamal, and I'm here to represent the University of Arizona. My partner from um, the UB were wondering why isn't the term tikfiri being used in substitution hmm. for uh, the word jihadist or the word uh, Islamist extremist or something along these lines? Um, so the takfiri refers to uh, the practice of uh, declaring other Muslims to be non-Muslims, excommunication, basically. And I actually like the, the, the term takfiri in an analytical sense because it does help to capture the difference between uh, that kind of jihadist group and others. I, I think the reason it's not widely used is that nobody knows what it means. Uh, I mean, I mean, again, just because if you're if it, if you're talking about strategic communications and you're trying to um, you know trying to tell people what things are. If you're a journalist and you're trying to communicate what people are, you tend to fall back on familiar terms. Those familiar terms can be very misleading. So like the term Islamist uh, encompasses an enormously broad range of different types of political actors, and yet it continues to be used uh, routinely. Uh, jihadist uh, is, I think, better for capturing a smaller slice, but it still encompasses a wide range of different groups. Um, I think Takfiri uh, is, is a, you know, it, on technical grounds, it does capture a significant part of their ideology, but um, I don't think it's likely to catch on um, at this point, unfortunately. Thank you. So, okay.